Church family, I invite you to open up in your copy of God's Word to the book of Revelation. Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14 is our text for today. The title of our message is, Why Go? Why Go? Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read from God's Word. You follow along in your copy as I read. This is the Word of God. Then I saw in the right hand of Him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because there was no one found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshipped. Heavenly Father, this is Your Word for Your church today. God, would You open up our hearts and minds. Give us soft hearts, humble spirits. Help us to tremble before Your Word. Teach us Mold us into the people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why go? Why go? When I use the word go today, I have in mind what we often refer to as the Great Commission. Do you know what the Great Commission is? It was given by our Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 28. And I'm just going to give you the, the, the main part of it. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's what Jesus said. Go and make disciples of all nations. So, we're gonna, I'm going to say the word go a lot, and that's what I'm referring to. Go and make disciples of all nations. That great commission. But why? Why do we go? There's different places in the Bible that we could turn to to answer this question. Lots of different right answers we could give to, to answer this question of why go. Matthew 28 is actually a great place because Jesus told us to. Why go? Because Jesus said to go. Go and make disciples of all nations. But today I want to answer the question why go using a different passage of Scripture. When missionaries are asked what their favorite book of the Bible is, many of them respond, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. Why is that? Is it because that missionaries are really into debates about the end times? Is it because missionaries are really smart and they're able to interpret well a book that many people find difficult to interpret? Is it because missionaries love using their imaginations and so they're drawn to a book like Revelation that's full of imagery and symbols? No, that's not, that's not the reason they give for that being their favorite book. Missionaries often give the book of Revelation as one of the greatest sources of encouragement for them in the Bible when it comes to both answering the call to go and sticking with the call to go because of this. The book of Revelation gives us an incredible glimpse into the future. It gives us an incredible glimpse into the future. And what we see is that God in the future completes He completes His promised work of destroying evil and establishing His eternal kingdom for His people to dwell in that is perfect in every way. 
It is a kingdom that's free from sin and the consequences of sin, and it's full of the blessing that comes with dwelling in the holy presence of God. Revelation gives us a glimpse of what is coming in the future, and that glimpse of what is coming in the future propels God's people to abandon all in order to live for Him in the present. That glimpse of what is coming leaves the missionary, leaves the follower of Jesus any of us saying it's worth it. My labor is not in vain. This is why I go. And the glimpse we get in the fifth chapter of Revelation, that passage, glorious passage that we just read, is none other than a picture, a glimpse into the throne room of God. It really begins back in chapter 4. If you wanted to glance your eyes back to chapter 4 for a moment, there we see the holiness of God on display and the representatives of creation and the representatives of God's people falling down in worship of the one true God. But then there's a problem that arises. Say, a problem in heaven? Well, just for a minute, okay? Just for a minute. There's this problem that arises. There's a scroll with seven seals and it needs to be opened, we learn at the beginning of chapter 5. But the problem is there's no one who is found worthy to open the scroll, to break the seals and open that scroll. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, no one is found. In fact, in verse 4, we see that John, the apostle, as he's having this vision of, of heaven, he breaks down and he begins to cry. He begins to weep because no one is found who's worthy to open this scroll. Now, what's so important? Why would that bring John to tears? Well, the opening of this scroll sets in motion the rest of the book of Revelation. And the rest of the book of Revelation describes God making all things new. It describes justice being served on the wicked and the people of God entering into God's presence forever. John, and along with all of us who believe in the Lord Jesus for salvation, all of us who belong to God, we long for God to finish what He started. We long for that day when, it, when, when He finally finishes, brings to full completion the promise that He made in the Garden of Eden where the promised One, the Deliverer, that Son of Man, would crush the head of the serpent. Where He is banished forever into the, into the pit of hell and God establishes His kingdom forever and ever and ever. We long for that day. And so this scroll is going to set in motion that coming. But when no one is found, John begins to cry because he wants that to come. He's longing for that day where he gets to live with his, his God in heaven. There's got to be one who is worthy for such a task to break the seals, open the scroll, and be the finisher of God's eternal plan of redemption. And that person that we see in this passage is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more! Stop your crying. Behold. That means look. Stop crying. Look up. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, He has conquered so that He can open the scroll and its seven seals. And then John looks up. But when he looks up, he doesn't see a lion. That's one of the titles of Jesus. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But he doesn't see a lion. He's called the Root of David, but he doesn't see a root underground. He looks up, and what does he see? He sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain. A lamb standing as though it had been slain. And that lamb comes over and he takes the scroll from the one who is on the throne, God the Father. And when the lamb takes the scroll, which means that all that God has promised His people is about to become a reality. The book of Revelation is about to happen. When the lamb takes the scroll, the throne room of heaven erupts in Joyful, loud worship of the Lamb who is standing as though He had been slain. It erupts and the celebration grows in intensity until all of heaven and earth are shouting, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. And it's in this celebration that I think we find some answers to this question, why go? And I just want to share four answers with you today. Maybe today you're asking this very question, why go? Maybe today some of you are wrestling with God's call to go. I don't know where that might be to. might be across the street to share the gospel with a neighbor. Maybe it's across the, 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 the schoolyard, the classroom, to share the gospel with a classmate. 
Maybe it's somewhere in this world where there are groups of people that have never even heard about Jesus. Maybe you're wrestling with God's calling on your life to go. Maybe today you have a family member who's answered God's call to go and you're struggling with letting them go. Maybe today you're walking in obedience to God's call to go. You're, you're striving to do that. But the enemy is whispering doubts. Is whispering doubts. Is whispering doubts. I want to share with you these four answers to this question. Why go for, from Revelation chapter 5? Why go to the nations? Why sacrifice to get the gospel to the nations? Why pray and give and send to the nations? Why go? Reason number one, church, is this. We go because Jesus died for sin and rose in victory. Jesus died for sin and rose in victory. That's a reason why we go to the nations. Now, you don't see the word cross or the word empty tomb in the words empty tomb in this passage, but Revelation 5 only makes sense in light of the cross and the empty tomb. What does John see? He sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And the new song that is sung begins with these words there in verse 9. Worthy are you to take the scroll. For you were slain. You see that phrase? For you were slain. The one who is worthy, this Lamb of God, who we know to be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, has been slain. That means put to death, slaughtered. He looks like a lamb who has been led to the slaughter and whose blood has been poured out. That's what they see. A lamb having been slain. He bears the marks of suffering and death. And yet, he's not laying there dead, is he? He's standing He's standing. He takes the scroll. He receives the praise. He is alive, church. This lamb who was slain is in heaven alive. Bearing the marks of his death, but very much alive. Even verse 5 described him as one who has conquered. He has conquered. He has not been defeated by death. He has conquered. Friends, at the heart of why we go is the simple and yet eternity-altering truth that Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross and He rose up from the grave. In His death, He paid for our sin and in His resurrection, He conquered death. It's the heart of the Gospel, this good news of Jesus. I love what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the Gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. And then Paul says this, for I delivered to you as of first importance. The most important thing in all the world is this. He says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried and He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Church, we go because there was a cross on which hung the dead Son of God and there's an empty tomb out of which walked the resurrected Son of God. We go because there is a Lamb in heaven who was slain but is now standing and will stand forever in victory. We go because the world needs to hear that sin and death have been defeated. We go because Jesus died for sin and He rose in victory. Reason number two is this. We go because Jesus ransoms sinners from their sin. We go because Jesus ransoms sinners from their sin. You say, yes, Jesus died for sin. And He rose up from the grave. But why is that good news for us? Why is the, that just not just good news for Jesus? Congratulations, Jesus. You died and you, and you defeated death. You rose up from the grave. Why is that good news for us? Why is the throne room of God and all of creation erupting in praise for this Lamb who was slain? It's because of what He accomplished in His dying and His rising. He didn't just do it for Himself. Friends, He did it for the world. He did it for sinners. He did it for you and me. The result of Jesus' death and resurrection is that sinners are ransomed from their sin. Look at verse 9. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. See, the bad news, it's the worst news in all the world. It's the greatest problem in all the world. It's that every person is enslaved to sin. We come into this world enslaved to our sin. We are chained to our sin. Sin is our master. It rules us. And because of this sin, we are separated from God, Scripture says, and we are objects of His wrath. He must push us far from Him and punish us with the righteous punishment that we deserve. But the new song in heaven declares that there's this blood that was poured out. It's the blood of this Lamb who was slain. It was poured out on Calvary's cross. And because it was poured out, 
Sinners can be ransomed from their sin. Sinners are ransomed from their sin. You know what the word ransom means. We often hear it when somebody gets taken hostage, right? And then what do they demand? They demand a ransom. It's a price that has to be paid in order for the hostage, the captive, to be released. That's exactly what it means here. The the blood of Jesus is able to set us free from our bondage to sin. The blood of Jesus is able to wash us clean from our sins so that we can then be forgiven and accepted by God. The blood of Jesus is able to rescue us from the wrath of God. And, And the fires of hell, as described in Revelation chapter 20, and in place of that, give us a a free gift of everlasting life in the kingdom of God that is so beautifully described in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Church, the death and resurrection of Jesus is good news because it means there's hope for sinners. And notice the certainty and the sufficiency of Jesus' work of salvation. Notice what the Song of Heaven doesn't say. It doesn't say, by your blood, you tried to ransom people for God and we're all crossing our fingers just hoping that that it works. That's not what the Song of Heaven says. The Song of Heaven also doesn't say, by your blood, you almost did everything necessary for people to be saved and hopefully there will come along someone else who can finish the work no church the song of heaven says to jesus by your blood you ransom people from god period by your blood you ransom people for god it's a done deal there's no ifs ands or buts jesus cried out from the cross you remember those glorious words it is finished done deal sinners ransom forever from their sin Friend, the death of Jesus in our place provides a certain salvation because Jesus was a sufficient sacrifice. And that gives us reason to go. I mean, think about this. Why go to sinners if we only carried a message of condemnation? Well, we wouldn't do that. That would be pointless. Why go to sinners if we only carried a message of potential good news? This might work out. If our only message to sinners was, you're a sinner, there's no hope for you then obviously it would be foolish to go. If our only message to sinners was, you're a sinner, Jesus died for sin, now I'm not sure 100% if it's going to work or not, but if you believe in Jesus, there is a chance that you might be saved. Well, it would be foolish to go if that was our message. But that's not our message. Our message to sinners is this, you are a sinner. But God loves sinners, and He loves sinners so much that He sent His one and only Son to die for sinners, like you and me. And His death was sufficient. It was enough to provide for you a guaranteed salvation if you will believe in Him. Through faith in Jesus, you will be set free from your sin. You will be adopted into God's family forever and ever. And church, since that's our message, it would be foolish not to go it would be unloving not to go it would be unloving it would be foolish not to do everything that we can to get this good news to sinners who need to be ransomed from their sin we go because jesus ransomed sinners from their sin let me give you reason number three reason number three we go because jesus sacrificed himself for all the nations We go because Jesus sacrificed himself for all the nations. Sometimes you hear people say, maybe you've said it or thought it before. Probably, if we're honest, all of us have said this or at least thought this before. Why go across ethnic and lingual and geographic boundaries to share the gospel? I get that the gospel is good news. I I get that. But why go to the effort of overcoming ethnic differences and language barriers and the logistical hassle of moving across borders to faraway places? I think the song of heaven answers this question very simply. It's because Jesus sacrificed himself for who? For all the nations. Verse 9, for you were slain. This is the song of heaven. And by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them, who? Those people from every tribe and language and people and nation, a kingdom and priests to our God. And they, who? The people from every tribe and language and people and nation. 
You have made them a kingdom of priests to our gods, and they shall reign on the earth. Church, God's eternal plan of salvation, this has been his plan from the very beginning, includes people from every nation, every language, every ethnic group, every people group on this planet being ransomed from sin, united into one kingdom under God's rule, transformed from God's enemies into his priests, servants of God, and tasked with reigning forever as ambassadors of King Jesus. Forever and ever and ever. That's God's eternal plan. You don't know what God is up to today. He's up to accomplishing that plan. That's what God is doing. That's what he has always been doing in this world ever since sin entered into the world. And that's what he will continue to do until this lamb who was slain breaks open the scroll and ushers in the new heavens and the new earth. The song of heaven is telling you, it's telling me that Jesus died for people who had the same skin color as you and for every other skin color represented in this world. Jesus died for people who speak the same language as you and for people speaking all of the other thousands of languages in this world. World. Jesus died for people who are citizens of this nation, but he also died for people who are citizens of all the other nations in this world. Jesus died for people who live near you, across the street from you, but he also died for people who live in all the other places on this planet, across borders and across oceans. Friends, Jesus commanded us to go to the nations because he had suffered and died on the cross, enduring the wrath of God for the nations. The gospel is good news for the world. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, you know this verse, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. To who? Everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then in chapter 10, Paul wrote this, for there is no distinction. We put all kinds of distinctions uh, between us and other people in the world. Sometimes even distinctions between us and people that live down the street from us. We make all sorts of distinctions. But when it comes to the gospel, there is no distinction. Paul writes, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But friends, of course, it's only good news in the ears and in the hearts of sinners who need to be saved if they hear that good news. And so Paul goes right on in Romans chapter 10 to say this, how then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Friend, if Jesus didn't die for the nations, then the gospel is not good news for the nations, and there's no reason for us to go to the nations. But Jesus did die for the nations, and so the gospel is good news for the nations, and so there is reason for us to go to the nations. We go because Jesus sacrificed himself for the nations. Reason number four. We go, church. We go. Because Jesus is worthy. He is worthy to receive the reward of His suffering. We go because Jesus is worthy to receive the, word, the, 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 the reward of His suffering. Our church, let me go ahead and tell you, I, I, I didn't come up with the words of that reason right there. So I'm going to want to take credit. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, where those words came from. But church, as we look at this passage and we look at it kind of answering this question, why go? This reason here for why we go is the main thrust of this entire chapter, this entire passage in the book of Revelation, this entire scene of the slain yet standing lamb taking the scroll. Notice in this text, four times in chapter 5, we have the word worthy. It's one of the most important words in this passage. In verse 2, we have this scene in the throne room which began with this search for one who is worthy. Remember verse 2? Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And then there's weeping. Remember when no one is found? Verse 4, and I began to weep loudly because no one is found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. But then the one called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, looking as a lamb who was slain, and yet he's standing, he steps forward, and the representatives of God's creation and the representatives of God's people declare in song in verse 9, number 3, third time, worthy, we see this word, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. And then all the angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, they join in this mighty chorus and they say in a loud voice, 
Worthy, there's the fourth time, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and honor and might and glory and blessing. And then all of creation. Notice what it says, all of creation in heaven and uh, on, on the earth and under the earth, everywhere, all creation joins in this chorus. I mean, it's got to be just thundering with noise at this time and praise to the Lamb. And, and they declare the worthiness of God, of, of Jesus, when they say to Him, to Him, not to anyone else, but to Him who sits on the throne and to this Lamb, to this Lamb who is standing yet He had been slain, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Church, the main thrust of this passage is that there is one who is worthy, and it is Jesus Christ. Jesus is worthy. Why was He worthy? Was it simply because of His position and His power? Well, those things are definitely part of His worthiness. And we get to see His position and His power played out in other places throughout the book of Revelation. But I want you to notice the reason that these singers in heaven, these worshipers say that Jesus is worthy. They give a very specific reason. What is it that gets highlighted about the Lamb in this passage? What is it that everyone, including John, seems to notice about this Lamb? They don't look at Him and say, whoa, look at that crown on His head. They don't look at Him and say, wow, look at all of His power. Though He has those. They look at Him and say, wow, look at Him. He died. He was slain. That's the thing that they notice when they look at Him. He looks like a Lamb who was slain, and yet He's standing it's not his position or his power, it's his look of having been slain. Three times this passage describes the lamb as having been slain. John describes him as bearing the marks of being slain. The four living creatures and the 24 elders give this as the reason for the worthiness when they declare in verse 9, notice this again, worthy are you, they sing, to take the scroll and open its seals. Why? They say, for, here's the reason, you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God. And then when the angels join in, they call Him not just the Lamb of God, but they call Him the Lamb who was slain. Verse 12, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. The thing that is standing out to everyone in heaven are the scars on Jesus' hands and feet and in His side. And I don't know any other scars maybe that the Lord allowed Him to carry with Him into heaven so that when we look upon Jesus in heaven, the first thing we'll notice is He died for me. He died. There is, there is the One who loved me so much that He laid down His life. Church, Jesus is worthy because of His sacrifice, His death, His blood poured out, His suffering. Now I say, what does this have to do with the call to go? Brothers and sisters, Jesus shed His blood for the nations. And so think about this. Consider this for a moment. He shed His blood for the nations and so He is worthy of the nations gathering around His throne, bringing Him praise and glory and honor. Because He died for the nations, He is worthy of those people for whom He died, gathering around Him, giving Him the praise for dying for them. As two missionaries put it, the Lamb who was slain is worthy to receive the reward of His suffering. I told you I didn't come up with the wording of that reason number four. There's these two guys, um, and it's a true story. Two guys, they heard about a group of people living on an island. These people had never heard the gospel of Jesus. They didn't know who Jesus was, never heard the gospel of Jesus. No one was going and sharing the gospel with them. And they, they didn't like that. They said they need to hear about Jesus. And so they decided to go to this group of people. There was one catch along with all the other catches this is many, many, many years ago of trying to get somewhere a long way away before air travel and all of that. The catch was this group of people were all slaves. There was a slave owner on this island that owned all of these people, and they were slaves. And so you couldn't get access to them unless you were a slave like them. And so these two, these two guys said, we want to get the gospel to these people, so we're going to go over to this place we've never been, to these people we've never met before, and we're going to sell ourselves into slavery so that we can live among this people, so that we can share the gospel with them, so that they can hear that Jesus came and died for them. And so that was their plan. Their plan is to go, they packed their bags, they told their family and friends goodbye, they boarded a boat to sail to this land that they had never been to with the intention of selling themselves into slavery so that these people could hear the gospel. And as the boat pulled out, one of the guys looked back, looked back at his friends and his family, Standing there, this is what he said. He didn't say, pray, 
pray for me or pray for us. Or, or you didn't even say pray for the people that we're going, that we're going to go share the gospel with. This is what he said. He didn't say pray that we'll have safe travels. None of that. This is what he said. He looked back at them and he said, may the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. What was it that drove them to go? It definitely wasn't the promise of an easier life. And, and it wasn't even the reality that there were people who hadn't heard about Jesus and would die and go to hell if they didn't hear and believe the gospel, though I'm sure that was motivating them, and that is a good motivation to go. But even deeper than their understanding of the power of the gospel, and even deeper than their understanding of the need of the people to hear the gospel, was their understanding of the worthiness of Jesus Jesus has poured out His blood for the nations and so He was worthy of the nation's praise. They couldn't bear the thought of the one who had laid down His life for people from every nation not receiving all the praise that He was worthy of. Those people for whom Jesus died, they need to get around the throne and give Jesus the glory that He's worthy of. The Lamb who was slain was worthy to receive the reward of His suffering. Friends, perhaps the greatest hindrance to our willingness to let go of what is comfortable in order to go to the nations. Perhaps the greatest hindrance to our willingness to give sacrificially so that others can go. Perhaps the greatest hindrance to our willingness to let go of sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews and friends and give them our blessing as they go. Perhaps our greatest hindrance to not centering our churches upon the mission of God but getting distracted by all sorts of other things. Perhaps it's not a lack of understanding of what the gospel is. We know what the gospel is. Perhaps it's not a lack of awareness that there are people dying and going to hell every day who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is true. But we can say those statistics all day long and it makes no difference in our lives. But perhaps our greatest hindrance is failing to see and behold the worthiness of the Lamb who was slain. He is worthy of our obedience. Do you see Him there in heaven? Do you see this lamb who was slain for the nations? Do you see him standing there? He's worthy of every sacrifice. He's worthy of every nation, tribe, and language, and people hearing of his death and resurrection. He is worthy of that great multitude in Revelation chapter 7 that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before his throne, dressed in white, Revelation 7 says, because they had been washed in the blood of the lamb, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Church, He is worthy of all of this. And so friend, let me ask you today, is your life declaring the worthiness of Jesus? Is my life declaring the worthiness of Jesus? I want you to know I'm preaching this sermon today as much for me as I am for you. Am am I declaring the worthiness of Christ in the way that I live, in the things that I give myself to? Have you declared His worthiness by trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? That's the first way that you declare His worthiness. It's by saying, I need Jesus to save me. I am one of those sinners who needs ransoming. And Jesus, I trust in You for salvation. Maybe that's the way that you need to declare the worthiness of God today. Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus today, are you declaring His worthiness by living out what you say that you believe? You say that you believe that Jesus died for your sin and rose from the dead and is worthy of all praise, but is it evident in your willingness to make sacrifices so that the nations can hear about this Lamb who was slain for them? Does your commitment to the mission of Jesus reflect the true worthiness of Jesus or does it make Jesus look like a sideshow in heaven rather than the King of kings and the Lord of lords that He is? Church, Jesus died for sin and He rose in victory to ransom people from every nation. He is worthy to receive the reward of His suffering. That, that is why we go. Is it hard? Yes, yes. Is it painful? Sometimes, yes. Do we know all the answers? What's going to come in the immediate future? No. But we know what's coming one day. That's why we go. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that Jesus is exalted. He has been exalted in the words that you've laid on my heart to share. God, 
God, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. God, you call us to all, diff- all do- sorts of different ways to participate in your mission. God, just help us all to do our part in seeing the Lamb who was slain receive the reward of His suffering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.